So Mary, the mother of Jesus, is only mentioned twice in the Gospel of John, and her name is never used. Here, what we just read, Jesus calls her woman. And I listened to one podcast this week where the exegetes, the, the students of scripture said, yeah, yeah, it's kind of rude that he said that. And then I read in another resource that it was a sign of respect. Uh, so I looked it up and, and it's really just the word woman. And you, how was it re respectful or disrespectful depends completely on context. And in this instance on tone, which of course we can't know. The next time that we see Mary, she will be at the foot of the cross at the end of the story. Here she is at the beginning, she'll be at the end, bookends. Right? He will say again, woman, but with the words, here is your son, and to his disciple, here is your mother. And then the, the gospel writer says that Jesus knew that it was now finished, and he would say, I am thirsty. His ministry begins with turning water into wine, really good wine, we're told, and ends with drinking really bad wine or sour wine. So John 2, Jesus offers the best. John 19, he's offered the worst, uh, fitting, fitting bookends of our salvation story. And it's so fascinating studying scripture because you always discover new things. And I was so excited about the idea that Jesus starts his ministry with turning water into the wine. And then, and, and then I could see him in the garden praying, like, please take this cup from me. And then I, and I said, oh my gosh, I looked it up and realized that the, the prayer in Gethsemane only happens in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and not in John. So I was a little bummed, but then I realized where we're in, what John does, rather than go from the wedding to the garden, he goes from the wedding to the cross. I often share this, this and, and, and it's fitting, this wedding imagery. I often share uh, John 14, when Jesus is talking about when he's gonna go away when he's going to die. He uses wedding language with the disciples. He says, I will go ahead of you and prepare a place for you in my father's house, there are many rooms. And that's wedding language. And, and I'm, I've said it before and I'm sure I'll say it again. A, a, when there's an engagement, there's a year long engagement. And the, during that year long, one is to make sure that the woman isn't pregnant, but it also gives the, the groom time to build the room on his father's house, right? And when the room is done, it might be longer than a year, but when the room is done, an announcement is made that he's going to go gather his bride and bring the bride back to his house. And so, the, you know, the, of course, the word, you know, goes ahead, the bride gets ready, there's a long procession that happens. And the beauty of this is this is the language that Jesus uses when he's talking about death. He's talking about a celebration. He's talking about wedding, reunion. And ah, don't you love the image of that? The image that once we die, you know, that our loved, one, loved ones will gather. Don't think about it too much because I, I've, as I've been practicing this, I tear up a little bit to think about the people who will come to, to gather me when it's time for the big celebration and then back to the feast at the table with Jesus, right? We begin at, at, with John 2, and again, these bookends, it says, if you heard me say it, on the third day, that is just meant to jump out at us, on the third day. What happens after three days in scripture? Right? The resurrection, right? So we have here at the beginning, after three days, and the first day was the baptism, right? And we understand baptism as a dying to self, a symbol of resurrection. Uh, when we come out of the waters purified, forgiven, free. And in the story also, we have the six jars of water that were used for purification rites, washing hand and feet. So from baptism to crucifixion or from baptism to the Lord's Supper, again, bookends. Each of those jars held 20 to 30 gallons and abundance, grace upon grace. And I kept reading that this week, grace upon grace. And, and this is completely an aside, but if you have not opened the gift that some of our congregation members have prepared for us by, it came as an email, but now at this point, I would say, just go to the church's website and open the Advent grace upon grace. It, I didn't open it until after Advent, but it's a gift. Um, the stories that we're sharing, the, sh the stories of faith, the recommendations. It, you, this church really does the most outstanding newsletter that I've seen for any church. But it, because it comes in an email that it's not, there's no ask involved, no obligation. You know, we are being given a gift. I would encourage you to unwrap it. 
And when I did what the gift to me was recognizing that I'm on, on a journey with kindred spirits and that's a blessing. So total aside, back to the story. Uh, some people like to, to read, to jump to the end of the book. That's not me, but I know there are folks who, who skip to the, to the end just to make sure that everything turns out or okay or whether they wanna keep reading. Jesus he, at the beginning says, you know, my time has not yet come. That's the end of the story. But the beginning of the story and all the chapters in between are with Jesus entering into the human experience, teaching, healing, feeding, blessing, and loving, and all of it abundantly, and modeling for us what it means to enter into the human experience fully as a child of God. Mary sees that the family has run out of wine at the wedding. Weddings usually last a week, by the way. And we're to infer that the family is a humble family, a family with little means. And Mary has compassion and knows that her son can do something. And then there's this lovely, lovely exchange where Jesus protests, you know, it's not my time. And, uh, but she ignores him and says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And he does it. It's a very human exchange. The water becomes wine, the word becomes flesh. The love of God is poured out into a very real world with very real needs. And Jesus does not ignore the physical needs of people throughout the gospel. There are seven signs in the gospel of John. Uh, this is one and the other, another one of those is the feeding of the 5,000. Now Jesus does get frustrated that everybody's focusing on the miracle and, and he, you know, he underscores and tries to say, hey, I am the bread of life people. But he knows, we know, that people can't hear if all they can hear is the growling in their stomachs. The faith we are called to recognizes that healing, teaching, feeding, blessing, loving is what it means to live in response to God's abundant love for us. You know, there are many love, language, love languages. They are all required. And we see this in the early church. We read in Acts. In, in the book of Acts, that's what they did. They understood that their faith compelled them to see that everyone had enough. Out of their abundance came generosity. The love of God poured out looks like people getting fed, the shame taken away from poverty, the first becoming last, the overlooked getting lifted up. And one of our struggles in its human nature is that we focus on scarcity or perceived scarcity, fear that there's not enough. There's not enough to go around you know, of anything, you know, as children, we compete for our parents' love or the food on the table. You know, she got more than I did. It's not fair. Um, or who gets to sit in the front seat or who gets to sit? It's Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday weekend. So think Rosen Parks, who gets to sit? You know, Jesus shook things up in his day too. He spoke with a Samaritan woman. Now race did not exist in the Bible, the concept of race, but she was one of those people, you know, that were to be shunned. And he sat with her and offered her living water. He ate with sinners, prostitutes, and re reprobates. His disciples were uneducated. He stood with the woman about to be stoned to death and called people out on their hypocrisy. He challenged the law. He taught women. He called out corruption in the church. He overturned tables. He disrupted commerce. And John the Baptist, Baptist was arrested because he was uh, criticizing the government. He was criticizing Herod. That's, you know, when, when he was beheaded, they only had to go to the jail to find him. And it was because he was critiquing the government. Jesus entered into human experience with open eyes, a loving heart, a critical mind, and a sharp but loving tongue. And he didn't say, you know, it doesn't matter what you do because I'm going to die for your sins and forgive you at the end, you know, it, in recent years, it has struck me that if we just confine the gospel of Jesus Christ to in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven, right? That's welcome news to people who are comfortable in life, who don't want things to change, who commit horrific acts of violence or are completely indifferent to the suffering of others, you know, because, you know, it doesn't really matter, right? Because we're all forgiven. We are called to, ex to expand the gospel to despise sin, to want to rid ourselves from anything that would cause someone harm, that might wound a, a person's soul, to live out of God's abundance, to live out of a place of love, to see suffering and want to do something like Mary, like Jesus. And yes, we'll do it imperfectly, but we will do it. 
by the grace of God. Mary's eyes were open to the people around her. She saw, she responded, and she taught Jesus well. We're called to look and listen and love in Jesus' name. In John 2, Jesus performed the miracle in front of the servants. They were the only ones who got to see. You know, and ironic since we, we are also called to be servants. Uh, and you can bet that they told their stories. And we're called to tell ours. Jesus' first miracle of turning water into wine was for the basic needs of a family. And his last miracle was for the spiritual needs of all of us so that we might engage in ministry that meets the basic needs of families. And while we're doing it to tell the stories of how Jesus has saved us. Now is our time. May God bless the work of our hearts and hands and the words of our mouths. May they all tell a wonderful story of simple and sometimes courageous acts of love and mercy that give glory to Jesus, our Savior, now and always. In Jesus' name, amen.